Time now, it's 28 minutes to 10 o'clock. And up next is our guest, Kaya Sitole, sitting right across from me. He's a qualified CA. But uh, looking at you right now, I'm not saying that you don't look like a CA, <laughs> but you're looking very, very, very casual and comfortable, which is obviously a good it's thing. It's the weekend. It's, it's the, the weekend, weekend indeed. Yeah. Good evening, Kaya. Good evening, sir. Twenty-eight minutes ago, as I said before, we get to ten o'clock. Sitting across from me is Mr. Kaya Sitole, who is a qualified CA. And except for the spectacles, if one looked at him now, you wouldn't say that he's one of those people. Uh, is it true, Kaya, that uh, CAs or chartered accountants are, are very, very boring people? It used to be until I showed up in the profession. <laughs> um, I think that stereotype probably comes from uh, the auditing environment where people tend to wear a lot of grey. But I can assure you that the new bro- breed of CAs is, is far more interesting than what we used to have before. No, of course, of course. Look, let's talk about uh, you know the profession. Um, and and I was saying this just prior to you know us, us having this conversation and you know me throwing forward for the show is the fact that it seems that CAs or the profession. Um, of, of chartered accountancy seems to be very proactive because around about this time of the year, you're not the first CA that I've spoken to about what does what is this career, what are the opportunities for young people going into this. But let's start off by answering that one question that a lot of young people do not necessarily have the answer to. What is a chartered accountant? A chartered accountant is essentially an individual who's been empowered with the skills that enable them to be able to understand a lot of different businesses. Uh They're also able to be able to audit those types of businesses. And I think primarily the profession was founded on the auditing being the primary issue that we used to be uh, dealing with. Okay. But what the profession now provides is that it provides a a set of professionals that have a very holistic understanding of how businesses are run, how businesses ought to be governed. And what we offer to society at large Mm -hmm. is the ability to provide assurance, essentially, on the credibility of the financial statements that are provided by different entities and also the ability to sort of create different ways of thinking within a business environment. And I think that's the main thing that CAs tend to bring to uh, the society at large. That is by far the best answer I've ever gotten for that question. Thank you. Because because I've asked that question so many times before and, you know, after the person answers it, on air, mind you, and I mean, I can't say, oh, that was horrible. I don't Mm. know what you're talking about. But (laughs) for once, I have a sense of of understanding what it's about. But let's talk about that auditing function. I mean, Mm. one usually thinks of auditing, um, at least when I think of auditing, um, I think of a bunch of people, as you said, in grey, coming in and uh, saying to me that, you know, uh, Mr. Brooks, we need the following files from you. You give them those files. They mark it with a red pen or, you know, with a green pen or a black pen. And then afterwards you give it back, you know, they give it back to you and then your boss is very, very unhappy with you. Mm. I mean, and that's obviously a very limited understanding of auditing. What is the function of auditing, as you said, because I think it has a, a very important role to play in the world of business? I think the way auditing really ought to be understood is that um, the issue of governance within different business environments requires a lot of external oversight, as it were. Mm-hmm. And what the auditing function is capable of doing is you can bring in an outsider to say, look, we believe we've done things the right way over the past year or whatever the case might mm-hmm, be. Mm-hmm. Can you just come and check so that we can sort of have an idea that what, what we are doing internally as, you know, the guys in charge of running the business mm-hmm. is exactly what we ought to be doing. And I think what that also enables you to do as a business is to be able to sort of give assurance to external stakeholders to say, look, we've had independent people that have come and looked at our books. So when we say to you that this is the state of our business, you can be reasonably assured that that is indeed the case. So I think that's really what Mm, the auditing mm, profession mm. was created in order to try and achieve. Now, brilliant, brilliant. Now I have an understanding of this. Now, the thing is, the question is, what are you doing in the studio tonight? Why are you here tonight? Because you're here to explain what you know this, the, the the profession of being a chartered accountant is all about um what young people need to do if they want to pursue this as a career going into the future so let's start there i mean you know it, it might be a bit too late if you just finished your matric mm. and you did typing you did a bit of geography um woodwork uh, history and what else let's throw in another one there typing typing no i think we <laughs> mentioned typing business economics yeah, yeah or you know mercantile law mm. it's a bit too late now to say that i want to become an accountant is yeah. it not so not necessarily i think um the way we sort of have created the profession is that 
it really does enable access to um, a student who's essentially done maths and metric. I think that's our primary pillar. If you've been able to do maths and English and metric, it is very possible for you to be able to thrive in the field. Okay. The key issues that one needs to be aware of is that the material that mm-hmm. you'll be exposed to tends to be quite technical. So that's why we always insist that mathematics is a primary requirement. And there's also obviously going to be a lot of communication skills that you're going to have to master throughout your studies. So that's why the English leg comes into it. But I think when it comes to students that need to learn about what the profession uh, is really about, mm. I think for them, if you, are, if you are an individual who has a keen interest in learning about different business processes mm-hmm. rather than a person who has an interest in accounting, if you have an interest in learning about different business processes, then this is a type of profession that is so open-ended. You can essentially decide that my interest is in media, but I'd like to know how, you know, the governance of media and how the financial statements of a media company are created. Oh. So the profession actually doesn't restrict you to just auditing. You can actually work in any particular environment. I mean, my particular passion has always been teaching. So I did the whole CA thing and then thereafter I went back and then I said I want to get into academia. And there are very I few professions. That. I yeah. noticed that because, I mean, sorry to interject there, Kai Sitole qualified CA and senior lecturer at Wits University. Now, a lot of people would say, you're crazy. But I take off my hat to you. Because why? You're passing on those skills to other people. And as you said, um, your passion is in teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you have a qualification in. You are a qualified uh, chartered accountant, Mm -hmm. which means that you're going to use that. And tomorrow, if you want to, if you're tired of the teaching gig, you can go back and uh, start your own firm become a CEO of a company and so forth. So let's look at some of those career options that are open to young people. Yeah. And I think what the problem is, is that you mentioned two things. So let's start that as a starting point. Two subjects that young people need to do. Yeah. English and mathematics, mm. right? But because the, the job or the profession is called you being a chartered accountant, mm. the immediate assumption is, is that you need to be a whiz kid at accounting at school. Mm. That is the great misconception. Uh-huh. We have a lot of CAs that have actually only started studying accounting at university level and some academics have gone too far to say it's actually better to study at the university level because you do not come in with your preconceptions of what accounting is all mm-hmm. about. In reality, accounting itself can be learned as a, as a study of a four-year period. So we do not require you to have actually had exposure to it before. But the way most academics tend to uh, you know, present it is that it enables anyone who has no exposure whatsoever to be able to be on par with students who have done it for maybe a five-year period and even excelled in it. So we're able to bridge all those uh, deficits within the first year of study. And beyond that, people tend to thrive. Mm-hmm. Now that for, me is, that, that for me is a fascinating part because I think what the issue is here is and, and a conversation like this is very important because, let's be honest, a lot of our schools, especially schools in the townships and re- rural areas, do not have access to uh, guidance teachers or guidance counselors and people that can actually tell them this bit of information, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening is that someone puts all this energy, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't be doing accounting, mm-hmm. but they'll put a lot of focus on acing accounting at high school. And meanwhile, what you actually really need is mathematics Mm -hmm. as well as English to get into the profession. What then? So here you are, you're studying uh, your chartered accountancy. How long is the degree? How involved is it? How much work is it? Because I also don't want to oversimplify it to make it seem that, you know, anyone can walk in and walk out with the CA. Um, Essentially, it's made up of... um the academic program and the academic program is also made up of two parts Mm -hmm. you've got your undergraduate degree which will take you three years Mm -hmm. and once you've qualified um you've got your degree you then have to do a fourth year which we ordinarily call the honors in accounting year okay and it is only once you've completed that fourth year that you've got the ability to write the professional exams which we call the board exams now the board exams are sort of written nationally so students from different universities write a similar paper and that's essentially an initial test of the competence Mm. of the candidate and what you are essentially trying to test there is what the technical skills that they've learned over the four years are all about. And then thereafter, I think the, the, the focus tends to shift onto developing the professional skills of the candidate. So over the three years from the start of your articles until the end, we're really focusing on the professional skills that you can develop. And the assessment that we use in order to evaluate people's professional skills is referred to as assessment of professional competence. So In reality, it does take a seven-year period at a minimum to actually go from high school all the way up to being a qualified CA. And I think once you've obviously completed the seven years, then you've got the ability to then branch out and then decide where exactly you want to specialize in.
Well, that, that's, that's actually, and, and now you were talking about that undergraduate component of it. I mean, um, I know that there was, um, at, at Wits, when I was, and I mean, I studied there donkeys years ago. Mm. I, I realized that today that I've been working, this year's, I've been working for a decade. Wow, you old. Is, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was there, there was the BEC, mm. right? The Bachelor of Accountancy. Mm. Um, what is the at Wits University in this instance because that's where you're obviously yeah. uh, lecturing maybe you can even sp- talk about other universities with, mm. with equivalent uh, situations what does the person go in to study and, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I know simultaneously while there was the BEC mm. which then qualified you to become a chartered accountant there was the BCom accounting mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. which supposedly did not put mm-hmm. you on that stream. So what is it that students need to go in and study so that they're able to then pursue this as a degree or as a qualification eventually? Uh, for students that go under the different universities, I think it's very important for them to, do, to ask the question of whether this is the degree, the SAC accredited degree that leads um, onto the ability to write the professional exams. Mm-hmm. You are right. Some universities do have multiple streams. And I think the reasoning behind those two streams is that a BCom is a generic field to begin with. Okay. So within a BCom, then you've got a BCom accounting. So some universities used to have a very open-ended access route in which you could enter and say, I'm here to study a BCom. And only later on do you then realize that, okay, I want to specialize in accounting. And then that's what you would have called a BEC program. Currently at Wits University, we do have a BCom program, a generic one. And then we have a Bachelor of Accounting Sciences program. And that's the one that is accredited by SICA. So that's oh, okay. the one that leads you into the CA stream. And I think even at UJ they have something similar to that in that there are two streams and I think the important thing about those two streams is that essentially a lot of students do have the ability at the end of their degrees to migrate across so even if a student started across with a BCom degree and then realized later on that they wanted to be a chartered accountant it is possible for them to either do a bridging year thereafter in order to migrate across and be able to write the professional exams and I think it's a testimony to the different universities that have allowed that opportunity to exist because the entrance criteria tends to be quite strict and for Mm -hmm. some people they tend to become better as they get older so once a person is in a university environment then they sort of tend to thrive and you see that they could actually thrive within the profession. Oh no, that's great to hear. So, so now that makes it absolutely clear. Um, but I mean, so here you are, you've done your degree and then you said you write your board exams, right? Yes. What happens typically after that? Because I think that's the first question that people you know, need to also sort of have some insight to because there is this unfortunate trend and I will call it an unfortunate trend because I think that you find a lot of young people mm. getting uh, professional degrees, mm. moving into the workspace and expecting that the first job that they're going to get is that's where I'm going to get the Mercedes Benz mm-hmm. as a mm-hmm. as a company car, mm-hmm. and I'll get the big o- corner office, and everyone's going to sort of you know worship my feet mm-hmm. as far as I walk. Is that the situation for CAs even? Oh, definitely not. I think that's <laughs> why it's important for us to be very explicit that it is a seven year training. Mm. Our program before you actually qualify as a chartered accountant. Sure. So even when you've finished uh, your university, your four years, when you start in the workspace, you're actually part of what you may call an internship or a learnership. So for you, there is no entitlement to the Mercedes-Benz. It is really a three-year learning program. And at the beginning of that three-year program, you would have uh, written your initial uh, test of competence, which Mm. essentially tests what you've learned at university. And then over the three-year period, you are being evaluated by your managers and your supervisors on whether you are actually exhibiting those professional skills that we're talking about. So it is only at the end of that three-year learnership Mm. period when you've actually written your second assessment of professional uh, uh, APC exam, yeah. then we can say actually you've exhibited the skills that are required of entry-level CAs, and then you can sign up as a CA, and perhaps if you're lucky, you might then get upgraded to that Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> now, this is what I wanted to ask you before we get into sort of the nuts and bolts of young people now leaving uh, <laughs> university, because I know that there's the Tutuka Bursary Fund, and we have to talk about that yeah, one. Yeah. I've, I've heard the adverts here at 702 on a few occasions, and, you know, people giving their testimonials of how wonderful it worked out for them, <laughs> but we need to understand what it takes to get there. Yeah. But before we do that, so now... Yeah, you are. You've done all the, the, the training and, you know, you've, you've been upgraded, may, maybe not to a Mercedes Benz, but to a BMW. Okay, maybe a BMW. Let's, I'm let's a Mercedes say, man. You're a Mercedes, Mercedes man. Yes. Yeah, same here. Let's okay, shake hands okay. on that one. Yeah, no, yeah. Those BMWs are horrible. <laughs> Indeed. But yeah, you are. You're driving a BMW. And um, the interesting thing is that a lot of CAs mm. or a lot of CEOs of companies are CAs. Yeah. 
why the heck is that the case? And, you know, why is it that, you know, that seems to be uh, first preference for, yeah. for, for people? I mean, people are doing fancy MBAs, mm. uh, going overseas and doing MBAs and coming back. And they still have five years ahead of them working in the office and having a boss yeah. without <coughs> necessarily becoming the boss. But it seems that if you're a CA, you fast track to becoming the boss. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a great testament to the work that Cypher <laughs> and the universities have done over the years. So you were going to throw that one in. Eh? Yeah, they really do go out to the market and they try and find out, well, what type of skills do you need in the people that you want to mm-hmm. run your businesses? So when it comes into the curriculum design and sort of the professional competencies that we ask people to sort of, um, um, you know, develop over those years, it is designed with the intention of creating the type of leaders mm. and the type of financial managers that have the capacity to walk into any a business and be able to run it. And I think one of the great skills that we sort of instill in them is the sense of curiosity in that you'd walk into a business and you are more interested in learning about how the business is built up. And then you'll say, okay, based on the knowledge that I have and how this business is structured, this is exactly how to take it forward. So you'll see that most of the JAC listed companies mm-hmm. must have a CA as a prerequisite because wow. of the holistic skills that we sort of do provide to the different businesses. I didn't actually know that, that, that you know, you would find that that is a prerequisite within a company that they would say as part of their memorandum of agreement or their constitution in essence in, in putting this company together that the guy that we're looking for, the lady that we're looking for at, at that CEO level needs to be a CA. I, I don't know that. I just think the way they will design the job spec would be to say you need all the skills and luckily only CA seems to possess all the skills that t- tend to show up in those job specs. Yeah, talk about running a monopoly. <laughs> That's the way it works, man. <laughs> now let's talk about the Tutuka bursary because yes. as I said, there's a lot of young people listening right now. But before we do that also, uh, I don't want to ask all the questions. So if there's anyone out there that wants to talk about this issue, we talk, as I said, we're speaking to Kaya Sitole. He's a qualified chartered accountant and a senior lecturer at Wits University. If you want to give us a call quickly on 011-883-0702, alternatively 021-446-0567, SMS is on 31702 and 31567. And for those of you that want to use the social media, that's Twitter as well as Facebook, right? Please, by all means, uh, give me, uh, you know, give me a shout uh, by simply looking for hashtag talk at nine with the number nine. Alternatively, you look for Gershwell Brooks. That is G-U-S-H-W-E-L-L. And the surname is Brooks, B-R-O-O-K-S. Even if you're a parent or a sister or a brother to someone that just finished, uh, you know, school that is looking at becoming a chartered accountant. If you have any questions, I think this is your, your prime opportunity to, to talk now. Kai Sutole is from Wits University, is a lecturer there. So obviously, he would be able to answer some of your questions. The Tutuka Bursary Fund. Yeah. How does that actually work? What are some of the requirements that they look at for young people to get in? Because, you know, and I'm sure I'm going to be inundated with uh, people saying to me, yeah, but gosh, well, um, you know, what about young people that, that happen to be white? And mm. they do well. Yeah. Is Tutuka going to look at them? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a tricky one. I think just as a historic background, um, the Tutuka Bursary Fund was created in response to an identified deficit that existed. Um, around 2000, 2001, only less than 1% of chartered accountants were actually black and colored um, uh, candidates. So I think in response cool. to that, then SICA went out to create a coordinated effort at creating a pipeline of candidates that will transform the demographics of that profession. So I think we have to be very explicit in that our intention was to actually transform the demographics of the pipeline. This is why we only award the bursary to African and colored candidates. Okay. What really happens is that students are invited to apply when they're in their metric year. Now, the problem is that it is very competitive out there. So we can set the minimum requirements, but by the way it works out, if you are not in the top 300 of the students in any metric year, you're unlikely to get the funding package for that year. Wow. Top 300. We have 300 on offer as a minimum every year, but we have over 4,000 applications every year Sheen. of qualifying students. So in other words, to, to make it into that, um, you need to be amongst the top 300 students in terms of your mathematics and your English, uh, your other grades as well. Yes. You, you, know, really it doesn't help. To, you really have to work hard. That's how the competition is. Wow, that's, that's actually fascinating to hear. And then what does tutu, the Tutuka bursary cover? I mean, does it cover just your studies or is it uh, f- you know, for students? If the guy lives in Limpopo, 
mm. and he he's going to study at Wits University. Does it cover his dress? Does it cover mm. some of his food? Does it cover those type of things? Um, I think what is one of the interesting um, reports that sits with the Minister of Higher Education is the one that explained the fact that for a lot of the students that get into university environment, very few of them get out. So what we did is that we identified long ago that for a lot of the students that come from, let's say, the Limbop environment and come to this university, they are social um, social economic issues that mm. go beyond just their need to be able to study. So what this bursary does differently is that it does tend to focus on the provision of a lot of psychosocial support within the university environment. Oh, okay. So what we have been able to do over the past 10 years is that every single university that signs up to be part of the tutorial program then has to explain how exactly it will provide the academic support to the students, how it will provide non-academic support, whether it is, you know, dealing with the transition of universities. We have to give all of them an allowance because, you know, you mm. can't expect a person to study when they don't have food. So it really does cover all the costs of the, okay. uh, of, 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 of the, of the student as soon as they get to university. So and Obviously not the, the beer court ports and the you know the night out uh, you know let's fill up the dome i'm of the impression that none of my students went to fill up the dome <laughs> 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 yeah uh but yeah no no we don't cover those we do cover the core costs and the way yeah. i present it to students is that even now i'll be receiving the first year students on wednesday and essentially they don't have to pay a single cent towards the university we cover all their costs wow, so okay. whether it's registration whether it's tuition mm. meals and accommodation and all the books will be provided for so we have taken Taken away the financial burden from the students, and we simply say to them, "Your only requirement is to be able to study and succeed." And that's really how we run the program. Up next, I'm going to find out from you because I think that what we tend to do as South Africans, we're very good at procrastinating, as you know. We leave the stuff till the eleventh hour, and then, um, you know, we, we get very upset when we hear that there's no space for you and you mm. can't get into the program. Yeah. So I'm going to find out from you just in a few. When does one have to embark on, on you know, applying for the stuff? But anyway, someone wants to know here. Yeah, um, a few questions have come through via the mm. SMS line, and I think they're very important. Someone says, can I do CA after FEA at TVET College? Now, I know there's a lot of sort of, I don't know what FEA is, but I presume that's going to um, our universities of technology or mm. colleges. So in other words, the, what this person wants to, and I think it's a general question and a good one. We're talking about university mm. degrees here. Yeah. Is it possible for someone to do a diploma mm. um, and then migrate somehow into uh, the CA program. Yes, it is possible. I know in particular there is a program that is run at the University of Cape Town which simply says we want you to have studied something except anything except accounting before. Mm. So they have a one year program where anybody who's ever studied anything else comes in and then over that one year program they teach them all the skills that they need in order to cover the undergraduate program that CAs would have been exposed to and then the year after they can go into the honors program. Wow. So that one is unique at UCT. But I think even at other different universities you may be able to have a recognition of prior learning so let's say i've got a diploma mm -hmm. from a technicon and if i did very well in in, in my diploma they can be able to credit you for some of the oh, okay. Okay. so it, there, it, there are possibilities out there but you'd have to check with individual universities okay sure so in other words you can't just ask it as a general question you need to actually go to the mm -hmm. specific university yeah. and find out what what they're willing to credit or not yes. uh someone says mr brooks just want to know if your guest is the same guy as the one who appears in the january issue of destiny man and this is from Rasimate. In Tembisa. Are you in Destiny Man? Yes, yeah, I am. Because yes, I, I could see the moment, <laughs> the moment that I, you see the moment that you got all uncomfortable with the question. Oh, well done on Destiny oh, Man, by the way. I was actually hoping it wouldn't ask me <laughs> any, something else. But yeah, Destiny Man, I am in the January issue. So go out and buy it now because uh, Kaya is featured in there. Yes. Let's quickly go to Charlene in Johannesburg. Good evening, Charlene. Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes. Kaya Sitole. Yeah. How are you? I oh. went to university with you. Charlene Shalembe. Charlene Shalembe. Yeah, she's saying hi. And uh, ah. Sorry, Charlene. He was just getting... Uh, uh, his earphones were sort of just not 100% oh. there. So, uh, oh. Charlene Shalembe I says that you went to university with I you. I yes. a, a lecture room with you. I did my beat time with you. And I just want to um, say I'm proud of you. I'm very, very proud of you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, Charlene. Yes, yes, yes. All the um, best. At the, at the same token, I want to challenge you about something. Uh -huh. um, my challenge to you is 
they in Saipa, not just Saika. Mm. South African Institute of Professional Accountants. Yes. And you did touch on various subjects that people can venture off mm. to to um, be professional in other ways. Yes. Okay. Charlene, I'm so not, sorry. I did I'm sorry, it's because of time and we don't really have much of, of a great line coming through from Charlene there. So what I just wanted to know from you, she mentioned the other one, mm-hmm. right? What, what is the difference between Saika and I presume the other one is Saipa? Yeah, it's called the South African Institute of Professional Accountants. Okay. And essentially the difference between the two is that the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants has always administered its own exams. Oh, called okay. The CA exams. So people have written those, become members of Saika. While Saipa itself tends to be a bit more generic, so you could be a person who's a professional in internal audit, hmm. and you've never written Saika exams, so you can actually sign up to be a member of the Institute of Professional Accountants. Okay, so what's the difference between the two? If if I'm a member of Saipa and you're a member of Saika, um, who is there a difference in job opportunities? Is there... You know, that's what I'd like to... I mean, for young people listening right now. I, I think in in reality, the job market tends to dictate over time what it exactly is that they're looking for. Hmm. We still believe that there is a fundamental shortage of CAs within the country. So we're still on the drive of creating more CAs. But I think not everybody is interested in probably doing the work of what CAs do. So those are the people that we uh, be branching off into, you know, the cyber route. So if a person had a very, very great interest in, let's say, internal audit, then for them, the cyber route is probably more accommodating to that. So it really depends on the nature of the individual. But I think there are enough jobs out there across both uh, platforms. Sure. And this is the final SMS question that I have for you before we get to the issue of when is it that someone needs to start applying for the Tutuka bursary as well as looking at the possibility of becoming a a chartered accountant. Someone says, is there really a quality of life if the profession I have in the profession, um, I have friends that are qualified CAs. uh, They don't have much time to see or spend uh, with their friends and family, and this is from Lebo. So it's either that Lebo has a friend that claims to be a CA and mm. says, look, I'm busy all the time, meanwhile she doesn't really want to hang out with you anymore, <laughs> or uh, there's some truth to it. No, I'd like to believe that the quality of life does exist. And I think, obviously, what you'll find is that some people are at the stage where they really want to put in as, as many hours as they can in the workspace mm. and learn as much as they can. So that's probably what the friend is trying to do now. But I think that, you know, a person is able to regulate their own work hours. So if you feel that you should be working 10 hours a day, right. there are jobs that will accommodate you doing that. If you feel that you should be working only for four hours a day, you can open up your own consulting firm. So the scope exists for you deciding exactly how you want your work mm-hmm. life balance to be structured. I mean, you're wearing jeans today, for goodness sake. When do, <laughs> when do young people finishing matric right now, mm-hmm. right? Um, it might be too late now, finishing matric now. Yeah. But for the ones that are going to come in, you know, that, that are going to finish yeah. matric pretty soon. The, the ones that are in matric, they have to be very aware that our closing date is quite early in the year. It's on the 30th of April. Okay. And why that's particularly important is I mentioned to you earlier on that we have a lot of applications that we have to screen through so that we can come up with a final list of 300 students, as it were. So I think what is really important with students is that they need to consult with their teachers as soon as they start their metric to say, I'd like to be considered for this bursary. Can you facilitate me getting the forms? So we have a very vast network across the country where we can deliver forms to any student that is available oh, okay. anywhere. So okay. if you want the physical form, we'll make it happen. If you want to do it online, you can be able to download the forms from the Saika website. Quick website uh, address? It's www.saika.co.za. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there. Kaya, you were wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It is 10 o'clock. It's time for your latest eyewitness.